about 30 seconds, Mark. Okay, let's begin. A very good day to you all. Welcome to the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance's latest innovation knowledge session. Uh, today's session is presented by Boomer Consulting. Some uh, logistics before we begin. This session is being recorded. Uh, anyone that does have questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat uh, throughout the session. Um, this is also uh, not tax, uh, accounting, technology, or legal, or any other particular advice. Uh, and at this point, I want to turn it over to our host, Mr. Mark Stout. Mark is the Chief Innovation and Information Officer at Boomer Consulting. Mark, over to you, sir. Great. Thank you very much, Ron. And let me go ahead and get things shared here and get my screen set up so that we can see the chat. Again, as Ron mentioned, if you uh, have any questions or whatnot, uh, feel free to type those in the chat and we will address those as we go along. You can now also use the Q&A um, that is there. Um, it, that one probably will work a little bit better since we look to be in webinar format. So thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, I'm actually very excited about this opportunity. Um, a little bit of my background. I have been doing this for more than 25 years now. I have no idea how that happened. Um, but I'm super passionate about uh, initially technology and the way that it could be used strategically. So my background is really more on this, the, the technology side. But what I found out was is that so many people were leveraging technology as, um, as a cost center or as something that they had to have. And they weren't really thinking about it strategically. And what if we actually took that approach and applied it to the business? And we said, hey, this is something that could be a competitive advantage for us. So uh, my background is in a uh, CPA firm. I was a former partner and CIO at Cone Resnick, a top 10 firm. Uh, I was there for about 17 years. Now I'm a shareholder uh, with Boomer Consulting and my focus still is on the technology, but more the strategic technology side. And these days, much more on the innovation because the innovation is where we really have so much more opportunity. If we look back at the, the last 18 months, what we really see is that we took leaps forward in many different ways. There were a lot of different things that we thought were gonna happen in the next three years, four years, five years. And all of a sudden, it was like we were accelerating with some of the, some of the uh, strategies that were out there and some of the opportunities that were out there. So as much as there was chaos, there was also a lot of opportunity. Well, now we're generally taking a step back and we're starting to think about where are our future opportunities? If we thought this was gonna take three to five years in some of these cases, and, and now we're starting to see it pay off, it started to get here um, faster as we leapt forward, where are we going to innovate? What does our vision look like in the future? So today I wanna to talk about uh, one of my big passions in innovation and talk about the way that we innovate. So many people think that innovation is just sitting around with maybe, maybe you're drawing on cocktail napkins, maybe you're drawing on a whiteboard and somebody has this brilliant idea, light bulbs go off, history is made, you are going to be the Uber of something. That's not quite how innovation works. Uh, innovation is a lot more complicated than that. And we'll do a, a bit of a deeper dive and talk about where some of the opportunities for innovation really are. Now, 
uh, at, I mentioned that I am with Boomer Consulting. I've been there for about five some odd years now. And one of the things that we focus on is really helping companies go further faster. We know that you know that a lot of the things that you need to do are around uh, your processes and uh, optimizing those. It's around your talent, one of your greatest resources. Leadership and, and how we go forward, how we set those visions, technology as a strategic asset, and of course, growth. What are, what are some new opportunities? Those are the, the pillars at, that we focus on at Boomer Consulting, but we also think that there's an opportunity for exponential opportunities when we add innovation into that mix. So innovation becomes the, the 10x multiplier of each of those different pillars. So let's start off by thinking about a little bit about the, the, the consumer or the customer, the client's perspective. Um, and I love this quote by Steve Jobs. I, I think when we talk about innovation or creativity, um, we could probably fill an entire presentation and just uh, break down some of uh, his amazing quotes here. But this is one that I think is, is particularly pertinent right now, which is you can't just ask customers what they want and then try to give that to them. By the time you get it built, they're going to want something new. So we have to be anticipating what it is that the demands are going to be in the future. We have to be looking out and building that vision and saying, yeah, this is really where we think things are going to be going. So we need some sense of not reacting to the now, but really pre-acting on where we think those opportunities are going to be and, and really trying to buy into our own internal visions for that as well. This is, um, a, this is a slide that I like to use quite uh, often. It comes up in a lot of my conversations around not just innovation, but around technology as well, because people throw around that whole um, disruptive technology, but they also are, are conflating the two things, innovation and disruption. So um, start off with a quote from Gartner, disruptive innovation can hurt if you are not the one doing the disruption. So everybody is looking for that next big idea, that next, hey, here's how we're gonna do something that is gonna really disrupt the market, that is gonna disrupt the industry, gonna disrupt the profession. It's gonna make all those other things obsolete. This is kind of the Uber model or the Netflix model where you know, uh, if you were Blockbuster, you're not too happy about the disruption. But we have to think about innovation and disruption as more than just points. They have to be more of a scale. So if we look at innovation as doing the same things a bit better, we, have, we, we open up a lot of new opportunities for us. If we can continue to refine the way that we do things, if we can be more efficient, if we can be more effective, if we can continue to improve on those, that is really the beginning of innovation from this perspective. Now, there is also that, that we wanna do new things, right? We wanna grow, we wanna have new ideas, we wanna, we wanna um, look for opportunities that we're not taking advantage of, that is another step towards that disruption. So the big takeaway here is nobody likes to be disrupted if they're not the ones who are doing the disruption, um, but also the innovation really is on a, a much larger scale of things. There are lots of opportunities for smaller innovations that can have a big impact as well as those big ideas. Now, when we talk about innovation, I mentioned that it's not just a point in time. It's not something where we're sitting around and we go, aha, and the light bulb goes off and, and we say, I have innovated. It's much more of a messy process. Um, this drawing that is over on the left-hand side was actually from one of the Apple engineers. Uh, they were being interviewed and they said, you know, hey, how do you come up with all these great ideas? And he, he's actually pulled out a napkin uh, or a piece of paper there and, and uh, drew on it. And he drew the question mark and said, hey, here's the, the problem that we're trying to solve. And then here's the solution. Here's how we're going to capitalize on that. And then he started to draw all these wavy, squiggly lines. Well, yeah, it, it is, it's not just a go from, hey, I've got this great idea. I'm going to go straight to where I'm capitalizing, capitalizing on it. It can often be a messy, winding trail where we're going to have to embrace opportunities that, that didn't come across as pure successes. We're going to have to look at some failures and say, wow, that didn't go well, but what did I learn? Now, the other way that we can approach this 
in addition to acknowledging that innovation isn't just a linear process, that it's, it's very winding and messy, we can put a process around it. We can start to say, yes, this is how we're going to make this a little bit more um, understandable. So if we sit down and we think about innovation as an act, that is the messy part and getting there, but we can actually build an innovation process. And that's one of the things that we're gonna focus on uh, throughout our time together today. That is that innovation really thrives when it isn't an act, it is a process. So let's talk a little bit about what innovation is and what it isn't. Um, love this quote from Tesla. Um, somebody who knows an awful lot about innovation. Um, and, and his whole perspective here is that he didn't care that they stole his idea. It's that they didn't have any of their own. So let's think about how we come up with those ideas. Let's think about how we build off of things. And the first thing we need to do is, is define what is innovation and honestly, what isn't innovation? What is more leadership or management of the process? So it is, again, another scale here, but if we think about the opportunity to uh, create change inside of our business, then if we're looking at doing things, um, doing the right things and being more effective or doing things right and being more efficient or improving the things that we're already doing, those are things that we really shouldn't put into an innovation process. It is still innovation and still change leadership but they don't really need to go into the process. Those are the things that I would consider, yeah, we should probably just go ahead and do those things. We should make a leadership or a management decision and say, yes, if, if we can do the right things, I don't need it to go through a process to say we should be doing that. If I can improve the things that we're already doing, I don't need it to go through the innovation process to do that either. Now, when we start getting to the point where we're going to be cutting things out, we're gonna stop doing some of the things um, or we're gonna do away with things. Maybe we are streamlining our processes and we're going to eliminate some steps. That's where we wanna start thinking about it in the context of a process. Are we really thinking this through? So we have an opportunity when we think about things that are going to go through the innovation process, we go with cutting things away. We go with copying time honored tradition, doing the things that other people are doing. How can we put our spin on that? What is it that we can do that would be a differentiator in this same space? Wow, they, they're doing really well over there. What can we learn from them? So all of those are the copying uh, type level of change. Um, and then doing things differently. Um, you know, hey, no one else is doing this. Maybe we can put it into a separate category and do something that no one else is doing yet. And then you've got those finally, those breakthrough innovations, the big mountains that you're gonna scale where everyone is really trying to, to do, and that's the, uh, the, the level of the impossible. Um, you know, doing the things that can't be done or couldn't be done. That would also have to go through an innovation process because we wanna make sure we're vetting that, that we're learning from that and building off of, of those opportunities. Now I mentioned the four types of innovation. Um, and this comes from a Harvard uh, Business Review article on innovation, and I'll show you the uh, source for that in the next slide here because this is kind of a two-part slide. But I, I want to talk a little bit about these different types of innovation and how they fit into the picture. Um, the first one that is there is basic research, right? These are the things that's like, yeah, I kind of have that half-baked idea. Um, this is something that I want to explore a little bit, or I think there might be something here. Uh, we often hear this as emerging technologies, right? These are the things that you read about, whether it's uh, quantum computing right now or um, augmented reality or any of those types of things that are starting to gain some press. You read something, it tickles an idea, and you go, wow, this is, this is really interesting. What I have to do in this area of innovation, though, is research. This is where I am learning, and I don't necessarily know how I'm going to have that business case. For a long time, blockchain, I believe, has been in that basic research phase for a lot of companies. There are people who are looking at the opportunities that are out there. They're learning about blockchain, but they're not necessarily sure how they are going to build a business around it. They know that they need to build a business around it. They know that they need to embrace it and that it's going to be a part of a, a bigger future, but they don't necessarily know how yet. And one of the opportunities that comes out of that when you're when you're looking at those emerging technologies is 
the opportunity for thought leadership to get out there and say, hey, these are some of the things that I'm learning and I want to share that information. You can do that through different communities. You can do that through different peers. Um, and talking about other people, you can start to become a bit of an expert in that. And then you can leverage that innovation, that basic innovation or the research innovation as the technology or as the opportunity continues to mature. Now, the next type of innovation that we're going to talk about is disruptive innovation, right? This is where um, it's really focused on the environment. Um, what is happening in the world, right? Is there a, a technology shift? Is there a marketplace shift? Um, this is where we want to get better at doing the things that, that people don't want as much. So we want to get better at providing it to them. Um, this is also where we start to innovate the model itself. Um, I like to say for this one, best practices can be lethal. If we continue to do things that were the best practice, those are the th those best practices are based off of the, the prior conditions. When the environment changes, when the technology changes, then we need to be looking for those next practices. And that's really what disruptive innovation is, is going from those best practices to those next practices. Now, how this applies to us, I definitely think the last 18 months, um, we have seen a, a, a huge shift in the technology, in the marketplaces, and definitely our environment as we go to more of a new distributed workforce. Um, these days, Zoom, which we are all on and all familiar with, has become a verb. You know, let's have a Zoom meeting. Let's Zoom uh, and, and talk this through. That is a massive technology adoption that happened very quickly. So you can see where the disruptive opportunities are inside that market shift. Leaning into those uh, would be uh, leaning into the disruptive innovation opportunities. Now, breakthrough operations, or I'm sorry, breakthrough innovations um, are really focused around those, those super hard problems to solve, right? How are we going to solve this? Uh, you know, nobody's really figured it out before. We all know that we want it to solve a problem, but we don't quite know how. Um, and that's where really, when we think of those Ubers, we think of those Netflix, we think of Airbnb, some of those are really those breakthrough innovations. And oftentimes it's because they are focusing on the opportunities that are present with convergence. Uh, that is where multiple technologies, multiple shifts um, are taken into account. And when you look at it through the, um, the lens of cross, cross specialties and cross skills, um, then you can start to say, well, wait a minute, what if we apply this perspective and this perspective, and we're going to come up with something completely new? That's where you really break through um, and, and you go, aha, that's your light bulb moment, because you're solving a problem that was not very easy to solve uh, up until then. Now, the fourth and final type of innovation uh, that they define is sustaining innovation. This is also, much like basic research, this is not what most people think of when they think of innovation, um, but it is in a very important part of it. This is where we start to get better at what we're already doing. This is where we start to build new capabilities in the markets that we're already in. This is where we're, we're thinking about, you know, what issues are we trying to solve and how do we go through it? This is actually where most innovation happens for most companies. They are taking what they already do and they're learning to do it better. So they may be reducing the uh, labor that is needed for something or reducing the cost, from reducing the time that is there, but those sustaining innovations are where most companies are gonna spend the majority of their time. Now, if um, this is the um, uh, author of this article, um, is Greg Sattel from HBR. Um, you can find that on hbr.org. It's really, it's one of the first ones that comes up if you search under innovation. They actually have several good articles there. But if we think about these four different types of innovation and we, we graph them out, right? We put them on a matrix here and we think about how well is the problem defined, right? So do we know what it is that we're trying to solve or are we just trying to come up with better ideas? And then we cross that with how well is the domain defined, meaning how well do we know what we're doing here? How well do we know this area? That's where you can start to see some really interesting things. Um, as I mentioned, most companies are actually on a bit of a diagonal axis. Um, they're down there in the basic research and the sustaining innovation. 
um, that's where the majority of their efforts go, and that's how they design innovation in most of their companies. So if you were going to focus on that basic research and really invest in that, that's where you're going to have like a research division. That's where you're going to be um, reading um, different journals, different um, different articles and blogs. That's where you're going to go to conferences about things and really start to learn that that can even build into some of those academic partnerships that are out there where you become some of the expertise that is being leveraged in that research area. Now, as we go forward, uh, we also get into that sustaining innovation, and that's where we start to do road mapping. That's where we do R&D labs and design thinking. This is maybe something that we acquire a new, um, a new area and add that to our existing business. Um, Ron, it looks like there's a question. Hey, thank you, Mark. Just real quickly, uh, and for all of you on the call, thank you for joining us. Please enter those questions through the, via the chat or the Q&A. Mark, one of the questions I've received separately is when we look at sustaining innovation, which is where a lot of innovation happens, is there a chance that organizations get stuck in the sustaining innovation and don't get to see disruption in the way that they should over time, particularly with new technological innovations? Could you speak to that a moment? Yeah, actually, I think, I think that's a great question. And, and I would actually answer that, that uh, organizations can get stuck in any of these areas. Um, you know, you can get stuck in basic research where you're constantly looking for the next thing, but you're never actually applying it to try to get to either that disruption or that breakthrough. The same goes for the sustaining innovation. Um, this is where we can, it, it can be very dangerous to think about those best practices, right? We're, we're constantly looking for what is it that we're going to do? How are we going to take it? to the next level, but we're also not thinking outside the box. We are thinking about our existing business in, in most cases in both basic and sustaining innovation. And that is where some of the um, opportunity for what I call transformational innovation really happens. So you're gonna have, um, you know, uh, well, actually I've got a slide on that coming up. So we'll talk about that a little bit about the way that we budget for innovation and that we have to be cognizant that there are multiple types of innovation that we want to achieve. Um, and the, the, the perfect example, when you look at sustaining innovation, we need to also focus on those breakthrough innovations. This is where we are looking for that big idea. And, and this is where we know, um, know the problem really well. And we say, okay, so we've, we're over here, we understand sustaining innovation, we are working on all of these types of things that are gonna make us a little bit better about what we do. But if we can come up with a breakthrough innovation, that is gonna give us that competitive advantage. Um, the, the ways that companies often do this is through the, you know, kind of their Maverick prizes um, or groups, their Skunk Works is one that is often used. And then what I'm very fond of is open innovation or innovation sessions. Um, where we, you challenge people to come with new ideas. And if you take those new ideas and you apply them to, especially the sustaining innovation, that's where you can really see some opportunities there. Because you think, well, wait a minute, why are we doing it this way? Or why aren't we trying to do something there? So there is an exponential opportunity when you apply breakthrough innovation to the sustaining innovation. Now, the same goes for basic research and disruptive innovation. This is where we can start to see, you know, the different launch pads. Um, you know, I, I look at the disruptive innovation as the moonshots, the things that were like, wow, what if we were to really rethink the way that this is happening and do something completely different? Um, how are we investing our money into this? And are we, you know, the 15 to 20 rule, you know, the Pareto principle, are we spending all of our time just running the current business? Or are we spending 15 or 20% of our time thinking about what's next for the business? And this is where we have some opportunity to really disrupt the, the existing models and look outside of those models as well. So what are some of the steps that we have to take here? What are some of the things that we need to understand and bring to the table when we want to start innovating when we start when we want to start talking about these things now um, this is a, a key slide for us at boomer consulting we use this in a lot of different ways and methodologies but uh, and, and there's you know a fair bit to unpack here right so if we want to really transform if we want to do something that is going to make a significant difference move the needle significantly we have to check our mindsets and mindset is something we talk about quite a bit um, the first one is these days you have to understand that status quo is falling behind. 
status quo is not just keeping up and doing the same thing year over year. If you are doing that, you're actually falling behind. Uh, what you have to be doing is getting out in front of things. You have to be thinking about, hey, how can I get to the next thing? How am I going to get us to the next stage or the next step, not just keep doing the same things that we're doing? So that kind of goes back to that um, not falling in the trap of um, sustaining innovation. The other thing that I think is really important is, uh, as a mindset, is having an abundance mentality. Um, you know, you oftentimes will hear this phrase as, hey, I don't want to, you know, want to grow my piece of the pie. I want to grow the pie for everybody. I want to make sure that we're not fighting over scarce resources. And the reason this is important is because resources are oftentimes scarce, especially if you're talking about money or time or talent in each of these different areas. We have to actually think about innovation as an investment and something that is going to pay off for us. We need to be thinking about how is this going to, um, you know, not be a limited resource that we're spending, but thinking of it as an investment that is going to pay for itself and is going to create that more abundant, brighter future for everyone. Now, the other concept um, that I want to talk a little bit about is uh, momentum. Um, if you uh, have seen this formula before, you may recognize it. This is actually the formula for escape velocity. Um, and when we talk about innovation, one of the real tricks that we've got to do is overcome our institutional gravity, right? It's very easy for organizations to go, well, we've always done it this way. Or, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Uh, another insidious phrase that, that really can help prohibit innovation. So how do we break out of the gravity, the, the institutional gravity that is holding change back? Well, we've got to build up momentum to do that. Uh, we've got to get enough velocity going so that it will actually carry us out of the gravitational orbit of this institutional change that is being resisted. Uh, we do that by building small wins. We do that by, uh, we call it low hanging fruit and saying, okay, so what are some changes that I can make quickly? What are some innovations that we can ask people for that are going to give us some ideas that we can start to say, wow, yeah, that, that, that really works, that's a good idea. Let's start to build those up. We don't necessarily have to go directly to those breakthrough or those disruptive innovations. Maybe we can spend some time in um, the research phase or the sustaining phase of innovation to build that momentum and prove out our innovation processes and our opportunities as they are being defined for us in this brighter future that we're looking towards. Now, the other thing that we have to think about when we talk about innovation, and I, I started talking about this a little bit when we were talking about how innovation is messy, that it's not just a simple go from here to here, you know, go A, B, C, D. It just doesn't work that way. So we have to be able to, to understand and accept that there is risk in there. Um, the problem that we oftentimes have is that we don't really value what that risk looks like. We don't really think about how many failures or how many opportunities to learn we had to have before we had that disruption innovation or that breakthrough innovation, before we started to really get on that escalator where innovation is paying off. And I put a picture of Hank Aaron here because he's, you know, one of the all-time greatest Hall of Famers. And, you know, he hit 755 home runs. He had well more than 2,000 RBIs. And his batting average, a Hall of Fame batting average, was 305. What that means is that he got on base about every third time that he came up to the plate, which meant that two-thirds of the time that he came up, he did not get on base. When you think about it, about taking risks, you have to put it in perspective of what it is that we're shooting for here. So if you are trying to build those momentums and build those successes, you've got to be able to forget fast. So every time he came up to the plate, if he struck out, which he rarely did, or he grounded out or flew out, if he failed to get on base, the next time he went to the plate, he needed to be able to forget about the fact that he didn't succeed the last time. And he had to learn from what it was that he experienced. So if somebody did strike him out, the next time he would know better 
how to be prepared for those particular pitches. So we like to say that you need to have a mentality around forgetting fast and learning faster. So fail fast is really the opportunity to say, okay, let's try it. Let's give this a shot. And the worst that can happen is that we will learn some lessons that we can apply to our next opportunity. So we can't be afraid to take those risks. If you have a culture where success is demanded and it has to be 100% every single time, that is going to really stifle a culture of innovation. So we have to be able to lean into and accept and even look for some of those risks to take to really challenge our, uh, our opportunities to lean in towards innovation. Uh, this next slide um, actually has one of my all-time favorite concepts. Um, this is from a book by Daniel Burris. Uh, it's a book called Flash Foresight. He actually has another one out um, that has a lot of the same concepts, the anticipatory organization. Um, but I really like Flash Foresight. It's the one that I first read of his, and it really resonated with me. And it challenges us to think about our thinking and the way that we are approaching things. Are we thinking about our short-term problems right now when we're trying to solve and innovate? Or are we thinking about the longer-term problem? And if we think about the short-term problem, then we're trying to solve today's issues. But if we think about a little bit longer and we say, well, what is today's biggest issue? And whether it's a system that doesn't work or a market that didn't develop the way we wanted to or a technology that is, is being adopted slower than we were all hoping it would be, what if we skipped it and we just said, okay, we're not solving today's problem. Let's skip that particular one. Then we can start looking at that next problem and we start solving for a future issue. That's going to get us out of the operational aspect. That's going to get us out of the tactical response type of, of um thinking and get us into more of an innovative mindset. Forget today's biggest issue, start thinking about some of the problems that we might have in tomorrow's vision and tomorrow's future. This builds out by really taking some of those ideas and thinking about them in an anticipatory way. Um, so once again, we've, we've got a scale here. So we've got um, the clarity of our vision over on the left-hand side, uh, whether that's from low to high, and then our ability to execute strategy. So we have vision and strategy on our two axes. Now, where we really want to get away from, right? And I think everybody would agree that get, going away from reactive is the way to go. We want to be more proactive. That's where we start to think about strategy a little bit. But there's so much more that's out there. When we actually have a high clarity of vision, then we can actually be preactive. We know the problems that we're gonna face. That's skipping over the, today's problem um, and starting to think about the next set of problems. And those, time, those oftentimes solve today's problems at the same time. If we could just jump over those and get to the next level, those will actually solve today's problems because we've got our new system, we've got our new market, we've got our new client base, whatever that looks like, and all of those things change. And then finally, up at the top, that's where you really get into anticipatory. That's where you're starting to say, you know, I, I like to uh, think about the Wayne Gretzky quote, you know, I don't skate to where the puck is, I skate to where the puck is going to be. That's where our vision really coalesces when we start innovating towards that greater vision. Now, one of the tricks to all of this is you actually have to have space. You actually have to have time. Um, and, and you know, and creativity in order to be able to innovate. Um, this quote is from Peter Diamandis. Um, he's, uh, he actually wrote a book called Abundance, um, a phenomenal book, uh, but he also wrote another book called The Future is Faster Than You Think. And this focuses on a lot of those technologies that are out there that we would consider emerging technologies um, or could also be considered accelerating technologies, ones that are going to start to make a big difference um, in the way that we do things. And he takes a look at each of those different ones and how when you add them together and you get that convergence, that's where some of the, the greatest opportunities for innovation really are. Um, but in today's world, are we really giving ourselves enough time, enough free time to innovate? And, and I would challenge that in most organizations, the answer is no, um, especially since a lot of people are no longer commuting. They're working remotely. Well, what happened to that time 
that they were spending in the car. Um, for me, when I was commuting, I would oftentimes spend the, the time from when I left my home toward and going to my office, I'd spend that time thinking about all the things that I had to do. I would think about the, the, the issues, the bigger issues, um, even the daily issues, think about how I wanted my day to go. Well, now that I can just kind of roll straight over to the home office and start working right away, am I still being intentional? and deliberate about creating free time. This is something that a lot of business owners, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of high achieving executives really struggle to do is give themselves permission to have some free time and let their mind wander or create or ponder things a little bit. So uh, one of the big steps towards being more innovative is actually being intentional and deliberate about creating that free time. So all this sounds great, right? And, you know, woo, innovation, innovation for the win. How do we do it? How are we going to move our company forward? Well, there's a couple of steps that are involved here. Um, you know, the, the first thing that we need to do is look to what is it that we're doing, right? So uh, what is our starting place? You know, are we um, trying to solve a problem? Are we trying to explore a new idea? Great. Let's define that very well. Now, the next step is we really have to understand it, right? It's not as simple as saying, oh, that's great. Let's go buy something for that. That's not really where we're going to get our true innovation. So we want to understand what its strengths are, what its weaknesses are, what the opportunities are that are out there. And that will actually show us where we can put some focus and, and identify some potential innovative opportunities. The next step, and I think this is where most people want to jump towards. They don't necessarily take the time to properly define the project or the problem. They don't necessarily do their research. They jump right in and they start ideating. They start drawing on the whiteboard or the napkin or whatever else it is. But there, there is a time for this step. That's where we want to say, hey, now that we've done step one and two, now we get in and we start building it out. That's where we start to um, build the show, as we like to say. Um, what is it that this is going to look like and how are we going to um, really leverage that? So um, the next step, once we've kind of fleshed it out and said, hey, this is what we think we want to do. We have a working prototype, perhaps, or a pilot group to try it out. That's where we start testing it. We put it in you know, uh, through a refinement process with different feedback loops. We judge the success factors, all of those types of things. And then, and only then, do we go to client delivery and thinking about scalability as well. So there are really, you know, five different steps. What does that look like when we think about it as a actual innovation process? So this, uh, this slide actually defines Boomer Consulting's innovation process. Um, this is something we spent, <laughs> I would say, weeks but it's more like months um, really refining in, in and of itself. So we actually had to innovate our innovation process to get here. Now, the first thing we want to do is we want to collect those ideas. We want every single person to feel like they have the opportunity to make a difference during innovation. And we encourage people to fill out a form. They fill out an online survey and they submit that. Every single form that is filled out, we are going to pay them $5 per idea. Even if their idea is simply, I want $5, I think you should pay me $5, we will still pay that because we want to really be clear that every idea is valuable and that every person at every single level has the opportunity for us to innovate. So those are all things that, that we want to encourage that culture of innovation around. Now, once those ideas come in, we actually go through a review process for those. Uh, we have bi-monthly meetings. Um, we put each of those different things into our project management system, and we use Asana, but um, any of the standard project management systems would work for that so that we're capturing all of those ideas. Because one of the worst things that can happen is people submit an idea and they don't know what happened to it. Was it a good idea? Was it a bad idea? Did somebody just forget about it? So we want to make sure that we're building in a feedback loop. And so we use our project management software for that. Um, we also use what we call the project hopper. Um, this is where we are going to put it through a process 
that is going to help us with prioritization. And we do that by asking questions like, is this really consistent with our, our values, with our mission? Um, is this going to improve the client experience? Is this going to improve our staff experience? Um, what amount of resources is this going to need? And several other questions that, that are very specific for us to say that, yeah, these are the ways that we want to um, rank and weight the different ideas that come in. So we'll be able to actually have those, um, those best projects pop up to the top. Now, one of the values in there and one of the reasons that is so important is because we don't want to be pet projects that are making it. We want to actually put a data-driven system around this so that we can say, yeah, these are all these ideas, even though they came um, from someone who doesn't speak up very often um, or isn't uh, the head of the company or the head of innovation or the head of technology or whatever, these ideas are actually popping up because they hit more of the boxes than anything else we've got going on. So once we do that prioritization and we say, yeah, these are the ones that we want to focus on, key step is assigning a champion and a team lead. This is where we take it from idea and we start to make it real. Who is it who's going to do this? This is about accountability. And we've got to say that you know we want to assign a champion who is going to be the one who's going to communicate the vision for that innovation, for that project, for that opportunity, and the team lead, who's gonna rally the resources around that. From there, we go into the research phase. This is where we really seek to understand um, the opportunities that are out there. So um, you know, there's a, for us, there's a process if it is external innovation, meaning that it is client facing or a service line um, or you know, something we would bring to the market versus an internal process that is a um, increasing efficiency, increasing the way we do things. So uh, one of those sustaining innovations has a slightly different process, different people who are involved there. Um, but we, we still go through and we do our research. We talk to our clients. Hey, is this something you think that you would want? Not just is this something you think you would want, is this something you think you would pay for if we are doing market research? Uh, we look at the market, who else is out there, who else is doing this, um, especially if it's an internal product uh, or opportunity that we're looking at, that's where we do our demos. Um, and once again, part of the feedback loop, part of the innovation process, if an idea that was submitted gets to this point, we give that person $100. So we've said, yes, this is, this is um, a great suggestion. We are going to invest some of our resources in it in, in doing some researching and figuring out what this would look like. And we'll give you $100 for getting to this particular point. The next level is really around that decision making. One of the things that I really struggle with uh, when I go into organizations and help them with their innovation process is a lot of times they think that, okay, who makes the decision? And the answer is it's not just one person. It's not just one group even. Um, different innovations are going to have a different level of decision made by different groups. So in some cases, it is our innovation action team. Um, a a cross-functional group, I'll talk a little bit more about how to build one of those in just a little bit, but a cross-functional group that looks at these different ideas. And yeah, sometimes the decision is at the level where the innovation team itself can approve things to move forward. Other times you need to look at the executive team. This is your leaders, this is your top level, um, or it's your shareholder team, You know, your, your, your people who have a stake uh, in the business itself. Or maybe it doesn't go forward. And, and at this point, we would archive the idea. Notice we wouldn't get rid of the idea uh, because we do have a process to go through and look at some of those archived ideas and say, hey, has the market changed? Has the market shifted? Is now a better time for us to be looking at these things? So we want to go through that decision-making process and move it forward um, into the next step or put it into the archive um, bucket to be reviewed again later when something changes. The final step is how are we gonna actually implement this for success, right? We've got a great idea. We've done all this work on it. We have followed a process to make sure that we're setting up for success. Now there are still things that have to happen. We actually need to build a launch team. That's where we get all the different pieces involved, whether that is sales and marketing, um, HR, um, you know, our different consulting areas, each of those, those functional areas need to be aware of what's going on and so that we're really doing this as part of our business, 
not building just another silo. Um, then we actually have a process plan for that. And of course, if it goes to actual implementation, then it's going to qualify for a significant annual innovation award um, where we will give them some recognition for having the, um, the best idea of the year. Uh, oftentimes, what the size of that award is, we always try to make it significant, but if it's an um, external market-facing one that has generated a whole bunch of new revenue, that would obviously be bigger than one that is um, increasing the efficiency um, and is a little bit harder to track metrics-wise. So we leave that open for a little bit of interpretation, but that's as much so that we can give a bigger prize when it warrants it, warrants it as to say that we're, hey, we've got a base level here. All right, so how do we actually budget for innovation, right? This is, we're, we're all, you know, in, in different companies, we are working with limited resources. Well, Gartner is the one that gives us, you know, quite a bit of insight in, in ways that we can think about the budgeting process and how it would apply to innovation. The first thing we have to do is understand where our resources, or in this case, our budget, um, is really going towards. In most cases, we're spending about 80% of our budget on the run category. I like to say this is keeping the lights on, right? These are the things that keep things operationally running smooth. Um, if, if it is in the um, run category, then the goal or the mandate is to maintain our current business capabilities, right? We need to be able to do business. This is business continuity. How do we keep things running? Here, we have a little bit of a split. This is where we can say, hey, we want to think about things that are going to grow our business. This is where we have the opportunity, and this is really the sustaining innovation around here, is does it make money? Um, and that's where we want to expand our existing business capabilities. That's We can do things like enhancing the different roles. And to go back to the original question, this is oftentimes where people get stuck. They spend all of their innovation on growing the existing business. What you also need to do is you need to think about how do we actually drive new business capabilities? How do we um, revolutionize things for either our clients or for our staff? These are the innovation roles, the innovation um, opportunities where, where we're really asking people to think a little bit outside of the norm to challenge some of those norms and ask where those opportunities are that is more transformational and spending about five percent of the budget on the transformational opportunities there is a really good um, good way to make sure that you're not going to get stuck in just kind of that grow area you're looking for those breakthrough or those disruptive innovations by investing resources in them All right, so what are some of the, the traits of an innovative organization? I mentioned mindset uh, a little bit earlier, and that main, you know, that is still super, super important. That is still something that we really need to make sure that we are keeping at the top of mind as much as possible. And we have to think, you know, we have to start from the premise of there's a better way to do things. There are still opportunities to refine things, to make things better, to do things more efficiently, more effectively. And starting with that, not everything is perfect, but there are opportunities is the first step. Now, the other thing that really has to happen ties right back into that very first Steve Jobs quote. Um, Innovative organizations focus deeply on understanding customers' stated and unstated needs and desires. And let's think about those two words, needs and desires, a little bit here. There are opportunities in both. Um, oftentimes, you're, you're selling either something that people want or you are selling something that people need. And understanding that, hey, people need a tax return um, because they're required to have one. They don't really want a tax return or they want more business advice. They want more insights. They want uh, predictive and prescriptive analytics. That's a pretty big um, need for understanding which ones are uh, your customers wanting and which ones are they required to have. So understanding those two things and really 
leaning into the direction that you want to go with that. There are opportunities in both. Uh, one of the other traits that is, is really necessary for innovative success is collaboration. And don't just think about collaborating with, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I normally don't work with Joe who's down the hall. Um, let me work with Joe and see if he's got any new ideas. Let's make sure that we're looking across the entirety of the organization, that you're, you're asking all the different perspectives that are there inside of your organization, but also beyond the organization, whether that is um, uh, subject matter experts, whether that is a, um, an alliance or a community that you may belong to, those are also opportunities to leverage um, some of that, that insight and some of that learning that is there. So, um, and then actively cross-pollinating that as well. I think this is also the opportunity to, to lead through thought leadership. Um, then, of course, you've got to look for um, a organization that recognizes, and recognize is actually the key word here, recognizes that success requires experimentation, rapid iteration, and frequent failure. Um, that it's okay to fail fast, that it's okay to say, hey, yep, we thought we were going down this road, but, you know, we learned a few things and now we're taking a, a, a pivot, one of those words that's oftentimes overused. We're going to pivot a little bit here or we're going to remap this um, and, and experiment a little bit that, that to really innovate, we, we don't start with all of the answers. Um, and I see a question has come in. I'll get to that in just one moment here. Um, and the final point here is empowering people to take considered risks, voice dissenting opinions, and seek those needed resources. This is a really tough one for a lot of organizations. Um, it is very difficult to empower people to take risks, to put themselves out there, to say, hey, I've got an idea, but it might not work. That can be a really scary thing, or even more so, yeah, I think your idea is good, but here's a way to make it better. And look for those dissenting opinions and, and move them over and really seek the outside resources that are needed for that. So um, one of the questions that just came in was, uh, what are some of the cues that you see for unspoken needs at an organization? Um, so going back to really un, you know, looking at your customers' needs and desires. I really like to think about this from um, um, going through a process of saying, what does the future look like for them? Um, and you know, th that's one way to do it is to really say, what does their business look like in three years, four years, five years? And what do we think that they're going to need that we might be able to, to uh, provide to them? So a lot of times they're stuck on sustaining innovation or they're not even thinking about innovation at all. They're just pure operational. Doing a little bit of their own work for them and visioning out what their business might look like in a few years is one of the, the opportunities to do to really get to those unstated needs um, and, and anticipate those needs. One of the other things that you can do um, is think about is go through a client experience transformer. Um, this is actually one of the consulting areas that, that we have started doing for our clients is thinking about how do you go through um, the client experience and how do you map that out? Where are the pain points in the entire way that they deal with either us or with their clients or with other pieces that are out there in the market and mapping each of those different out and looking for those things that maybe they didn't know um, existed uh, and that they didn't know that they could ask for or ways that we can help them identify new areas for efficiencies. One of the things that I am seeing an awful lot of right now um, is companies that are committing to innovation and they are putting in place a innovation leader. Now, um, this list is actually from um, the Harvard Business Review back in 2014 when they really started um, talking about innovation as a role in companies. And I don't think that every company needs a full-time chief innovation officer. Um, I'm not even sure that they need a full-time innovation person in every case. Uh, it's gonna vary widely uh, from company to company, but they do need an innovation leader. They need somebody who is going to get down and really own 
the fact that innovation is a process, that innovation is an investment, and that innovation is something that is going to move the company forward. So the, the, the key roles for an innovation leader still say the same, right? So what are those best practices and, and are we going to support those? And when it says supporting best practices, it doesn't mean the pre best practices that were there 20 years ago. It means those next practices. What are the best things that we can do going forward, not just because we used to do them, but because this is actually going to help us increase something. Also developing skills. Um, I feel like this oftentimes ties into that research phase of innovation. Letting somebody go to a conference on blockchain, letting somebody get a um, uh, um, some education on a new technology that they may not understand, diversifying their skill sets, um, bringing someone in to show everybody the power of analytics or whatever else it is that you are looking at as an opportunity for acceleration and convergence, you need to build those skills up. You're not going to have experts on day one because you don't have that particular market share yet or you have not gone down that road. So in some cases, you're going to actually need to build it before you, you know, build the skills to support it before you can actually launch it. So um, being proactive in that area. Um, supporting the business units in new products and service initiatives, understanding what your clients are looking for. This is what this is really about. Sometimes the business units get so focused on, um, on responding to their clients, they're not trying to anticipate those clients. So an innovation leader should be able to ask those questions about what is next. What is it that they're going to look for down the road? Um, identifying new market spaces. Um, I love this one. This is this is a little bit of um, taking some of their own research innovation and applying it back into the business as well. Helping people generate those ideas. What does this look like? Yes, okay, you had an idea. Let's sit down and talk this through as opposed to saying, yeah, it's not fleshed out enough. Maybe the person doesn't know how to do that. Maybe there is a, uh, a project filter that you can use that will actually ask questions and interview them and give some, um, some scope and some scale to the ideas that are there that then are able to move further into uh, the innovation pipeline. Directing funding, uh, whether that is seed funding, pilot funding, um, if it's an innovation um, um, workshop saying, hey, our winner is going to get $10,000 to see how far they can get their project. How are you leveraging those funds and that budgeting? Um, this is also going back and saying, are we looking at just operational or run uh, type budgeting? Or are we really looking at the, um, the grow and the transform as opportunities for innovation? And then I, I think this one's also really important. Um, and there's a lot of different use cases out there where an innovation leader had to protect promising projects. Um, this is especially true in the profession that I have spent a lot of time uh, working with CPAs, uh, because oftentimes promising projects, the return on investment is longer than, um, it's not the attention span, but it's longer than the patience level people have for those returns on investment. So designing shelter where longer term projects can actually um, continue to build momentum and continue to thrive and develop and mature to become those bigger promising projects later on, that is another key role for a innovation leader. Now I mentioned um, that we have an innovation advancement committee. Um, the mission of that team is to innovate the client service and the client experience. Now we define our clients as both internal and external, right? We, we serve the other people that we work with as well. So to be part of that, um, we, we've got some guidelines on membership. So we, we like those out of the box thinkers, right? Um, somebody who can say it's, it's not, you know, who, who will bring ideas to the table. Um, they're not just the same things that everybody is seeing, but they're thinking, wow, what if, why don't we, why can't we? Those are the kind of people that we want to um, uh, participate in our innovation advancement committees. Um, they also have to be willing to challenge the status quo. That is not that easy. It sounds easy, but when we talk about change and we talk about change management, one of the things that's true is that everybody believes in change, 
But generally, most people believe that you should change or someone else should change. They're not really as comfortable changing themselves. So are you willing to go and lead the change? Are you willing to change that status quo? Uh, multidisciplinary, making sure that you're not just getting one group of people together and siloing some of those ideas, but really looking across the entire organization. Um, and in many of ours, because we are working with um, organizations that have client-facing people, we want to include those client-facing people in here. So it's not just um, internal people, but client-facing managers, directors, partners, um, you know, people who have been doing this for a while and really understand um, some of those unspoken things that the client wants um, or needs and how they might define those and can give us those insights. And then this one's really, really tricky, but is really, really important as well. Um, having at least 10 years of career runway. First time that, that we talked about this um, and, and really kind of uh, pondered it a little bit, this is like, ooh, wow, that's rough. You know, you you might be taking out some of your, your biggest thinkers, your, your most powerful executives uh, might not qualify for this, and how is that going to feel? But the more I thought about it, and the more that we, we saw this in practice, the more valuable this became, because if you are not thinking that you have a role with the company for more than 10 years, your perspective is going to be vastly different. Your idea of an investment is going to be vastly different. If I am looking to retire in the next three to four years, I probably am not that interested in a long-term investment that may pay huge dividends, but that I won't be there to see. I've got my own goals. I've got my own objectives that I might be focusing on. So removing them from that conflict of, of um, desires, as it were, um, or uh, you know, of, of goals and objectives actually makes the Innovation Advancement Committee work a lot smoother. So um, having the courage to say, yeah, we want people who are only gonna be here for a long time, um, whether that's five years, seven years, 10 years, I really like the 10 years because it is a horizon that is difficult to see what is over, but you still have people who are committing to building something for that level. What are the success criteria for the Innovation Advancement Committee? How do we make it work, right? So, um, you know, when we're working with accounting firms, we build that cross-functional group that's focused on creating a culture of innovation, which means we've got to get tax and audit and consulting and operations and technology, but we also want to build that outside perspective. And in your, um, when you look to do an Innovation Advancement Committee, you should also ask what are what would a cross-functional group look like? You know, which areas need to be involved? Is it sales? Is it marketing? Is it HR? You know, what what um, verticals do we need to involve in that? And then that outside perspective, getting somebody who can say, yeah, I think you're getting caught up um, in your own internal politics, or do you have the perspective of what is happening trend-wise outside of your own area? Uh, this is where um, somebody else who sits on another innovation uh, committee could be good. If you have another innovation leader um, at, at a different company, they can fill that role. Consultants can fill that role. Lots of different ways to bring in that outside perspective. The agenda is key. If there is one thing that I tell people that you cannot skimp on, it's making sure that you've got a very strict agenda, especially around innovation, because it seems like we can just wander. So yeah, great, we're gonna have a one hour or a two hour or a four hour meeting. It does not matter. You will use all of the time that is given to it because people will wander, they'll explore, they'll kick the tires, they may kick the can down the road, they may wanna circle back to things, they want updates. What we really need to do is say, hey, what is it that we're trying to accomplish here? So we need to make sure that our agenda is, is managing the things that we need to get done. That is the vetting of projects. You know, is this a project that is going forward? What stage is it at in the innovation process? How does that look? Um, let's talk about our resources. This is budgeting, but not just of, of dollars. This is also time. Uh, we like to call this air traffic control, meaning do we have so many planes in the air at the same time that they are starting to run into each other and we can't get anything done? Or are we prioritizing properly for our resources? 
are those prior priorities uh, meeting the expectations of the company? Are they in line with the company goals and objectives? Are they um, following the strategic plan for the company? That is also really important is to make sure that you're tying the way that the innovation advancement committee is looking at priorities into the same priorities of the strategic plan for the company. And then of course, there's an accountability aspect to things as well. Meaning that, hey, did you do what you said you were going to do? Doesn't mean that you have to have done the work, but you said you would assign the work or you would follow up on the work or whatever else it is. So there is an accountability aspect to that also. Um, definitely some rules of engagement, right? Um, when we come into the Innovation Action Committee, we're looking for solutions. We want it to be solutions focused, not here's all the things that don't work. Somebody has to fix this. It has to be made up of people who are saying, you know, I've got an idea for how we can fix something. That's the, the way we want those two things to work together. Um, they have to represent their functional areas. What that means is it's not just them that is here. They are a representative for their group, for their section, for their service line. Um, something else that we like to say, silence is an agreement, is agreement. So if you are not speaking up, but you don't like the decision or the direction things were going, but you didn't speak up, you, that is the same as agreement. So everyone has a responsibility to speak up, to share their perspectives, to share their opinions. That's why they are there. But once that happens, once a decision is made to move things forward, um, regardless of how close the vote was um, or what some of the objections were, the committee has to have a united, a unified front. Um, you know, we all agreed to this. This is the decision we came to. Now we move into supporting it. Um, each of the individual uh, members has a role which is to be excited about innovation. Um, it is, you know, not to say, ah, you know, we spent so much time and never get anything done, but say, oh, look, we've moved things, you know, forward. We want to be the cheerleaders for innovation because that helps build that culture of innovation. Um, oftentimes we have beta tests that come out of it or pilot groups and identifying who would be good to run that pilot with. Um, not just going to the same people every single time, but what can we learn from a different group of people? And then, of course, communicating back to the organization, communicating to the company um, that, hey, here's what it, where things stand. I mentioned um, a critical part of a culture of innovation is that communication and understanding how things are going through and what it's going to look like. Ron, looks like we have another question. Mark, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the questions uh, when you mentioned identify beta testers, can you can you guide us a little bit? What's the pool of, of people that would be part of the beta testers, and, and how does that process work? Uh, are they internal? Are they external? Are they both? Uh, any any clarity would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I still like the idea of dividing innovation. Innovation happens both internally and externally. So if it is an internal innovation where we are going to make something smoother for the way that we're doing, whether we're refining the process or um, we are, are adding different steps or cutting some steps out, if it is internal, then we would identify um, some of our own employees that would be part of this. And, so, and oftentimes it is easy to look for just the superstars. Um, look for the people who always get it and jump into things, but that's not really a representative group. You want some people who sometimes maybe don't adopt technology as fast, or they don't change as fast, or they have a ton of questions that have to be answered. You actually want to build a cross-functional group that is going to be representative of your company when you're doing that pilot. Otherwise, you're going to find out that, yes, my superstars love this idea, but the other 80% of my company does not like this idea. So you have to have a representative group. Now, the same thing goes to your clients. Um, if you are looking to do you know, a new service line or, or bring something to market, knowing which ones you have a relationship with where you can be open and honest and transparent about these are the things we're thinking about. This is the true status of it right now. Would you be able to um, would you be able to participate in that? Are you willing to give us that feedback? Oftentimes that is based mostly on the relationship that you have built with those particular external clients because there is a level of trust that is there. Um, it's very exciting, by the way, for, for many clients to be asked to participate in a pilot group. 
as long as you can guarantee it's not going to be disruptive to their business, then that's usually the, the thing that is the biggest concern. So we would want to make sure that, that you're building somebody you've got that relationship with, that they will give you honest feedback as well. Thank you. So hopefully that answers that question. Yep, absolutely. All right. So I, I want to spend a little bit of, of time. Um, we've got some more time for questions baked into the end here. But I want to I want to give you some tools to take back, um, take back with you that you can bring back to your team and that you can actually um, run through some of these exercises. Uh, we probably have half a dozen exercises that, when we are teaching innovation to companies, that we will will run through. Um, some of them help with visioning. Some of them help with prioritization. Um, this is kind of a really fun one, though, to kind of get your head around thinking in a new way, thinking in new directions. Um, this is actually a scene from The Matrix, uh, one of my all-time favorite movies. Um, it's one of those ones that if uh, I am left alone for any period of time, just kind of magically just starts playing on the, the, the TV. Um, and it kind of, it, it's a way of reframing uh, an oftentimes overused phrase. I've even used it a couple of times talking today, which is thinking outside of the box. What does that really mean, right? Thinking outside of the box. Um, and I love it when the, the answer is there is no box, or in the case of the matrix, there is no spoon. Um, even if we start to think about thinking outside the box, just the fact that we acknowledge there is a box is limiting our thinking. So how can we challenge our thinking to say, wow, this is something that is completely new, completely unexpected, very different than what we were doing before, um, and maybe makes no sense initially. Maybe this is something that is completely new. And this is based off of a psychological phenomenon um, called forced connections. And this is where we are going to leverage the brain's ability to link two disparate items. So two things that, that are not connected with each other that don't usually go together. Um, whether those are words or objects, feelings or ideas, and then use those new concepts generated by the linkages to think through a problem. So forced connections, taking two things that really you, you can't see how they would go together, but trying to apply those to a particular problem. Now, what are some examples, right? A video doorbell. Who would have anticipated that your doorbell would have been a video camera? Right. So how do we think about what that problem solves? Well, it solves security for us. Right. It's a really good idea. But who came up with the idea of putting a camera into the doorbell itself? Doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, here's another one. Sofa and bed. Two things that are, generally speaking, two very different things. Right. They're, they're two different pieces of furniture. What happens if you combine them together? I think most people at some point in their life has slept on a sofa bed at this point. Going down to the bottom corner, you could look at this one as either a uh, Apple watch, right? Who would have thought of an Apple and a watch together or a smart watch? Um, what are those two things going to do? Um, and then this one is actually, there's, there's a little bit of myth around this next one, uh, which is chunky soup. And the myth that is there is that, um, Campbell's as a soup company was struggling to grow their market share. And they're really the inspiration for this next exercise that we're going to do. Um, so they were trying to figure out how they got back on track. You know, people had been buying soup for forever. They weren't willing to pay a ton more for it. How are they going to grow? What are they going to do? And so they actually went through um, several different attempts to reinvent themselves. And nothing was really sticking until they started to do a forced connection exercise um, and is now called word soup, but a forced connections exercise where they took different words and put them together. And somebody took the idea of chunky and soup and put the two things together. And all of a sudden everyone was like, well, yeah, we, we don't have to blend everything. We can, you know, have bigger pieces in there and we can do this. And, it took off, it really revitalized the brand, but 
up until we said chunky soup, that was kind of a gross thing. Soup was something that you could literally drink through a straw um, because it was always blended. You think your tomato soups, you know, maybe your potatoes you would get a little bit of, but eating it with a fork, that's the kind of thing that was something that was completely new. And then, of course, uh, another one of those ones that I still don't necessarily buy into as the most brilliant idea, but they are selling a ton of them, is the smart refrigerator having a display built into the refrigerator itself. Not an idea that I personally think I ever would have come up with, but something that is gathering market share and is definitely out there as an innovation. So how would this work? Uh, we've created this form, and by the way, uh, we will make this, um, this, I meant to mention this earlier, this entire PowerPoint available for everybody as a PDF. So you will have a copy of this particular form that is in there to go through the word soup exercise with your team. First thing you have to do is step one, identify the problem that you wanna solve. Don't just start picking random words, um, but think about each of the different things that are there. Um, um, think about a specific problem that you are trying to solve. Think about, hey, what is something that you that is an innovation problem that you're trying to find a solution for? Then you pick a random word. It has to be a noun. Um, you know, it could be hamburger if you want, or it could be banana. It could be whatever it is that you want. It's just truly random word. Then think of four independent words that you associate with your random word. So four things. If you pick hamburger, what else do you think of? Uh, maybe you think beach. Maybe you think uh, pickle. Maybe you think french fries. Maybe you think vacation. Whatever it is, write those things down and then start to think about what comes to mind as you are trying to solve your problem. Um, if you think about, hey, how do we grow our market share? And, you know, we're, we're a hamburger joint, right? Uh, or whatever else it is, or we're fast food or, um, you know, we want to be in this space. Then you think about some of those things that you did with your random word associations. And I am literally, by the way, doing random word associations now. So I'm making this up as I go along. But, okay, I think hamburger and pickle. Is there anything there for me? Eh, I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe we can build a pickle burger, you know, come up with some kind of new, uh, new spin on that. You know, people either really, really love pickles or they really, really hate pickles. Not a lot in between. Okay, well, what about beach and vacation, right? Maybe we should look at getting out of the city centers where we've been or even the suburban areas and focus on beach towns. Maybe there is a new opportunity for us to expand, not where the population density is all the time, but maybe we could completely come up with a new concept that is going to appeal to people who are in those suburban areas when they're on vacation and they're willing to spend a little bit more money so we can actually make it a fancier burger and make it more of an experience. That's the kind of thing that, that the word soup will, will go through and do. So um, I just kind of walked through that. Uh, this is actually how I would um, uh, walk a group through doing this. Um, open up that, that PDF, define the problem. How would it impact your company in five years? Um, there, when I hand out this, I often give a list of words. Um, that is there. So um, sometimes people have a really hard time picking their own random word. So you can actually say, hey, pick, you know, five different numbers. And then here's a list of 60 words. Find your your words that are there and then do it. So if they actually have a hard time kind of making those initial randomized words, you can um, do a list of words for them there. And then I give them 10 minutes to, to really think it through. Um, way more time than I just took, but think through what those independent words would look like. Um, how does that? And then start to write down what comes to mind regarding the solutions for the problem. So if you notice on this form, there's not a ton of space. This is not a, a, a dissertation. This is jot down a couple of sentences. This is think through what this might look like, how this would apply, write those down and then get together then bring it back to the group and start to share those. Because where the real power is, is in going through this um, forced association and then sharing those. Because some of your associations are gonna trigger 
some of your peers associations and somebody will go, oh, wow, I never thought about a pickle burger. That's a really great idea. What if we didn't make it as an actual burger, but we simply um, uh, upgraded the pickles that we were and have a big pickle bar so that we did things like that. They can start to build off of those and you could start to come up with those ideas that again, we oftentimes say we want these breakthrough innovations or we want these disruptive innovations, but we don't invest the time to walk ourselves through those things. So um, just kind of winding up here a little bit, I talked a little bit about uh, Boomer Consulting and what we do, how we focus on process and talent, leadership, technology, and growth, but innovation is that multiplier. And, and hopefully uh, you can start to see how the process of innovation can add value inside the strategic business cases that we've been talking about inside um, every business for that matter. Uh, and one of the things that we have done is, is we've created the innovation action system. So um, these are all things that uh, are created from what we have learned um, in teaching innovation to different companies and where some of those successes are. Uh, I'll just walk you through each of these different kind of modules or workshops um, individually here at a high level. The first is really setting that vision. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to be in three years and five years and 10 years? How far out can we look? And what does that future look like? Who, you know, what do we want to be? What do we want to have? What do we want to do? What kind of clients do we want? What kind of life do we want to have for our, our principal owners? Then you have to address the mindset, right? How do we actually build that culture of innovation? Um, how do we actually move ourselves into looking at innovation, not as a cost, but as a investment going forward um, and think about that, that scarcity, that abundance. Um, we've talked a lot about the, the, the key part of innovation that a lot of people think of is, you know, that light bulb moment, that ideation. Great. We've had the, the, the idea, but is every idea the best idea? And how do we make sure that the best ideas for our company are the ones that are really um, popping up there that are going to the top and that are getting the most uh, most of our, our, our interest, most of our um, investment in, of resources that might be rather rather limited. Then we want to go through and, and go through a maximization. How do we how are we going to show our return on investment? How are we going to decide which ones are going to have the most value to, value to the company? What are some of the tools that we can leverage there that are going to help us maximize our pilot? programs uh, that are going to help us go through market research and talking to our clients and identifying those areas that are uh, unspoken as of yet, but are opportunities in the future. And then as with everything at Boomer Consulting, uh, we're big believers in accountability and building a system of accountability to make sure that innovation isn't something that happens on a particular day or just when you have a meeting, but innovation is something that becomes a, a, a constant within your organization and is something that is top of mind and that people are continuing to invest in as we go. And with that, I think we have uh, just a little bit of time for questions, if there are any additional questions. Hey, Mark, this is a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. And for everyone in the audience, certainly please feel free to submit your questions. I've been getting some questions uh, off screen, offline. Um, I do have one question, Mark. A while back, early in the presentation, uh, you talked about free time and the importance of, of free time. One of the challenges that I've seen is I, I think we still live in a world, particularly in the Western world, where free time is equated with doing nothing, which means you're failing or you know, you're, you're, you're wasting time. What, can, you, can you peel the layers back of that a little bit? Can you tell us a little bit? What, like, what tools do you use from the perspective of how to maximize free time? My, my, the thing I often tell my colleagues is free time doesn't mean dead time. And, and right. there's got to be good ways to really enhance our thought processes, for example. I would love your thoughts there. Yeah, you're, you're killing me here because this one hits a little close to home, right? Um, you know, I'm one of those type A personalities that, you know, took pride in working 80, 100 hours a week for, you know, during our busiest times. And I couldn't figure out why I wasn't coming up with any good ideas anymore. Um, and I had to really build boundaries. And that's the very first thing that I would tell you is, Boundaries are really important. The separation of home and work are really important. Taking time off, 
um, whether it's a weekend, and, and by taking a weekend off, I don't mean that you are constantly checking your smartphone, you're cleaning out your email, you're doing some of your, your to-do tasks. No, actually taking time off and going and doing a outside hobby, whether it is uh, fishing or reading or biking or boating or whatever else it is, giving yourself permission to do those things and this is the hard one, acknowledging the value to the company when you actually give yourself space. So it is, it is tricky to do. Um, some of the ways, Ron, that, that I personally have really kind of balanced that out a little bit, um, I do, uh, and, and our company does, uh, what we call the first 15. So uh, we encourage every single person to take at least 15 minutes a day to read a book, read a blog, educate themselves, do some research on whatever topic it is that they want. Because we feel like if they're reading a, a, a nonfiction book, a business book, a, um, you know, a new technology book or whatever else it is, they're gonna be um, inspired. They're gonna learn something new that they can then bring back. Um, so making time to read the blogs, to um, you know, read the books, uh, I am a, a voracious reader, as are most of the people at Boomer Consulting. So we're constantly saying, oh, hey, did you read this and read that? We're giving each other new ideas and then talk, and then making space to talk about those things. Um, that's one of it. The other thing that, that for me has been really good is I am a, uh, a big runner training for a marathon. And the reason I'm training for a marathon is because I need the big goal to keep me focused. Um, if I don't go out and run or don't do my exercises, don't eat, don't sleep, do all the different things, don't fuel properly, then I'm going to really not be able to get that done. But, but the running for me is actually space. It works kind of like meditation for me, where it's time for me to think things through. Even if I'm listening to music, I am still trying to think through a, a problem or a challenge. So I've replaced some of that, um, that time that was being lost to uh, commuting. And um, for me, I was a big traveler too. So even on airplanes, I would have a lot of that, that kind of free space to work through some different things. I've given it back to myself by scheduling time to be healthy and give myself some um, free space to do it while still feeling like I'm being productive. Great, thank you, thank you, Mark. And if there's any last questions from anyone in attendance, please uh, please post them now. One one last question uh, for me, Mark, and and you know me long enough to know I'll always keep asking questions. Um, I really want to talk about this concept of innovation and and what we're encountering in the world that we operate in uh, is almost the generational challenges associated with innovation. And what I mean by that are um, we're seeing 20, 30, 20 year olds, thirty year olds who, who look at innovation and disruption differently. Than, than older generations. And many of those older generations are, are in senior executive leadership positions. What advice do you have there? Because for me, and one of the things we often talk about is you need to make that engagement with younger generations happen within your organization. And innovation is potentially a platform and, and a, a tool to be able to do that. What, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so everyone, every single person, every generation has a role in innovation. And when we say cross-functional, we also mean cross-generational when we're building our innovation action committees or when we're asking for ideas. And one of the, the struggles that the, the up and coming, the rising generations have is they don't feel like they've got a voice. They don't feel like they're being listened to, that they're being really um, given an opportunity to make their mark. And, you know, um, Gen X in particular, uh, baby boomers, you know, kind of had that mentality of, hey, I got to pay my dues before I get to do that. That is no longer accurate, and they want the opportunity, which actually goes really well if we embrace it, because think about them as a competitive advantage. If you start listening to the people who are coming up, that next generation, as to what they really want versus what they really need, right? So let's go back to the, the needs and desires there. You might be giving yourself a huge advantage. You might be saying that, yeah, this is it. Now, of course, if your target demographic is all an older generation, then that may not be as impactful for you. But the question is, what are you going to do when that generation stops buying your product or you know, starts to leave the workforce or whatever else it is? So even then, it may be a further horizon, but it's still an opportunity to give voice to, to include, and to challenge some of those status quos that we rarely 
take advantage of. You know, we really needed to think about them as this, I think of them as a huge opportunity to really help us define what the future vision for the company looks like. Mark, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your wisdom and your thought leadership here. Innovation is always an important topic. Uh, we will make the recording available to folks. And I was just going to ask uh, if folks wanted to reach out to you, what's the best way to do it? And, what's, uh, and, and any last thoughts you might have? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can find us at boomer.com uh, is our website. Uh, there are links to me there. There's also some uh, great videos, blogs about what we do, that sort of thing. Uh, you can also reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, it is Mark Stout, S-T-A-U-T. There's only two of them that are out there. I am not the nuclear physicist. I'm the other one. Um, so you can find me there. Uh, I also showed my Twitter handle up at the beginning. It is uh, CPA Tech Geek. So any, any of dozens of ways to, to reach out to me, I'd love to hear from you, love to get your perspective. And thank you for this opportunity today. Mark, thanks so much. Thank you for everyone who attended. Have a great rest of the day. Cheers.